Hello, everyone. So before we start, let's wait for a few more minutes uh, just so everyone could get online and join us. So I'm going to start at around 9.35, actually. So, so yeah, just let's wait a little bit longer. Okay, so it's 35 past, so let's start this. Hello, today we'll be talking about continuous deployment. And continuous deployment is a strategy when as soon as feature is finished, it is deployed to production. So this is why this presentation is called Just Ship It. You have a feature, it's done, ship it. So before we go to continuous deployment, let's take a step back and talk about CI, CD. So CI part is continuous integration, but CD part might be one of two. It could be a continuous delivery or it could be a continuous deployment. So even though they look almost similar, only one step is like manual in continuous delivery, but basically means that if a feature is completed, it goes through all our pipeline and just before release to production, it is 
a manual step. So we can, we usually do pile up all the features during the sprint, then have manual regression done that security testing, maybe performance or UAT. And only after that, we deploy that to production. With continuous deployment, it's not the case. Everything is automated. So as soon as feature is done, it goes through all the stages. If there's no errors or warnings, it is deployed to production. So sounds kind of exotic, but it's not actually that uncommon. There is a state of DevOps report, which is a, a big survey happening every year. And it just basically all the responses are answering some of the questions and then they are grouped into elite, high, medium or low performance. So for elite group, they are deploying multiple times per day. And that elite group in 2018 was around 7%. But in 2019, that group grew up to 20%. So it's three times bigger than it was last year. And probably it would be even bigger on 2020, but 2020 was a crazy year. So we didn't have any data from there. Probably it was too skewed and we couldn't make a good assumption from that. But, <clears throat> but 20% is still a lot. Uh, imagine there's one engineer out of the five working on a project which can deploy to production multiple times per day. This is kind of amazing. And this is why elite performers are twice more likely to, to meet or exceed organizational performance goals. If you can be so quick, if your users can start enjoying the features or using them sooner than your competitors, you are twice more likely to be successful. So this is from a state of DevOps report. So, but there's more. Uh, for example, if you have an instantaneous turnaround for a feature, if you're done with the feature, it's, it's ready to be deployed to production, it will be deployed and users can start using that. But in, if you're not using CD and you're waiting for the end of the sprint, that feature, small, small change like quality of life improvement for the end user, might have to wait until the next release window, which might happen in a few weeks, and only then be available for the end users. So if everyone is not required to be babysitting these releases, doing manual regression, preparing test data, moving builds from one environment to another one, they spend more time developing the features. Same team, more time spent on features. And then everyone knows that what they develop, what they do, that, what they do tests for, it's actually going to have end up in users' hands in maybe a few hours. So everyone starts caring about quality more because it's that much more impactful. And when everyone cares about the quality, the only winner is the product, product itself. So also your users might be using companies like software like Amazon, Netflix, Walmart, or Facebook, and these companies are doing CD, continuous deployment. And if your users are using that, they probably have some kind of understanding what are the like paid services should look like. And if you're in the same, uh, same area, like if you're working in services as well, it, well, it's a hard competition and it probably will get even more crowded that way. And if you won't be able to be as competitive as others, you might lose your business. And there's another one more connected to the engineering, the people who are actually working on features. So you might have seen this before. This is a burn down chart. Basically, that blue line is that how fast we're expecting to burn points in the sprint. And the red one is how it actually happens. So sometimes we're better. Sometimes we maybe complete everything, but we're probably never below the blue line. So usually teams are not using this one because it's kind of decreasing the motivation. But this is actually showing us some issues with sprints. A lot of stuff is done at the end of a sprint. And this might be like, OK, well, as soon as it's done, it's good. But basically, you have more, it might hide some of the problems. Like, if you're at the end of a sprint, you have a story, and you're not sure if you're going to complete it, you're going to start rushing. You're going to rush developing. You're going to cut the scope. Maybe you're going to prioritize, like, this is a minor bug. We, don't, we won't fix it now, maybe later. This is edge case. We ain't going to fix it. So partially done that, cut the scope just to make it release, because you know that Next time you have a chance, it might be in a few more, few more weeks. And then good practices being sacrificed, like automation, uh, maybe some code maintainability. These things are not essential for release, so they can be skipped. And then you put that to technical depth. Then this rushed, like cut with the cut scope, maybe with some kind of bugs, 
these stories reach testing and those stories are usually reached that at the end of the sprint. Like most complex, most uh, consume, time consuming stories usually are completed at the end of the sprint. So lots of stories are being piled up in the testing column. And then test engineer have to either prioritize, like this is going to release, this one is not. Or it have to lower how much he spent time on each of these features. So the quality gaps might occur. And this leads to problems. Maybe not in this every sprint, but maybe every second one, maybe there is some issues in production. Maybe we just did, didn't deliver what we expected. So there might be estimate, underestimated stuff. There might be just QA is a bottleneck. There's a lot of things is happening within the sprint. We don't close them all uh, before the end of the sprint, before the demo. And this leads to the stress, like everyone's stressed out, like I don't like this end of the sprint, maybe others as well. So it's just not the best place to be working as an engineer. And we're putting that uh, teams like for this space every two weeks. It's just uh, kind of a burning paperwork of some sort. So if we're gonna enable agile, we might be using continuous deployment and this might actually solve the problem. Like. If we will be one day late by of closing this uh, task, maybe we can be one day late, but we actually develop it fully, test it fully, and then deploy it to production. There's no need to wait for another deployment. It's deployed as soon as it's done. So basically everyone can just work on the highest priority task and then finish them and deploy it to production, fully finish them. So this is how continuous deployment actually might elevate or remediate that issues with uh, sprint deployments. So if you want to enable full agile workflow, you might be considering de continuous deployment. When you have requirements and you know that these requirements might reach production same day, you develop them, you do the testing for that feature, then you deploy it to production, collect the feedback, then improve on that, uh, create that improvement, test it, and then deploy it to production. And all of this circle can happen in the same day. So this is actually fully agile workflow when we have minimal amount of time how we can improve our product in production. And if we're not doing that, we're still having some kind of sprints where we pile up the features and then deploy them to production after manual testing everything, this release candidate, then doing security testing, doing accessibility testing and lots of other testing before we release the production, it's kind of a waterfall process. Like we're not about out of waterfall yet, and we're having this micro waterfalls inside of the Scrum Sprint. So it's not that great. So why not everyone is using continuous deployment then? Well, you have some prerequisites you have to meet, or system have to meet, and there's some myths why people avoid those. Uh, for example, if you deploy so often, maybe you don't have time to actually ensure the same level of quality if you would deploy it after each sprint. And let's break this down. Uh, let's imagine we have uh, some e-commerce site. We're selling some items and then we have like item, price, tax, and total. And let's imagine we have a new story which is require us to update the tax calculation from January 1st. So on January 1st, new tax rules are, should apply. So if you're doing continuous deployment, we're following key principle of like database, backend, and frontend changes are not going to the same deployment. So it's like forbidding us to actually complete the, fully complete the feature in one go. So we have to split this up. And it seems like a nuisance, but it will make sense just in a few, in a few more slides. So just bear with me. So first feature, we need to update the stacks calculation, right? We can't show anything in UI because we don't have anything to show yet. We can we can calculate the new tax, but we can't store it yet. So we need to start with the database. And because we only can affect one thing, we can't finish fully this feature. We have to make it so that it would not impact the current workflow. So your current users will not see the difference. So we basically just can add a new column. We test that and we just ship it to production. It's there. Uh, no one's affected. No one actually notices that something had changed in the, in the production. So the second feature, we now can store the values. Let's calculate that. So basically inside the backend code, somewhere is a calculate item price and inside there is a function to calculate tax. So what we can do, we can duplicate that, change it so it would be calculating new tax and then just leave it in the code. So basically we're doubling the effort to calculate tax, but we both would have for each new item would have old tax and a new tax. It actually might create some performance issues, so you need to make sure you will not cause issues for your uh, for your perform for your environment. And basically, we will have new function added, 
will start collecting item for a new tax for this all of these items. So we test that and ship it to production. So the interesting thing happens here that we are now collecting a new tax calculation for live data, for actual purchases. And we can monitor that. We can look for any kind of outliers, uh, edge cases, or some errors. And if, there's er if there are any, we can fix it before actually any user are seeing them because it's not accessible by the end users. The end users only see their old tax calculation. So now we do need to change something in UI. So we want to prepare for that before January 1st, so we wouldn't have to deploy something on January 1st. So what we can do is just we need a way to show both values, but only the old val on, only old values should be shown for the end users, and the new values should be only shown to the development team, the UAT personnel. So what we can do, we can play around with permissions and have feature toggles to enable one feature, like uh, show the new tags only for development team. And this is how we can hide. We can do its testing. We can make sure that everything is okay. And we are making a good uh, good functionality with real actual live data. And for testing purposes, this is like, this is gold. This We can't get anything better than that. So what's gonna happen now is that on January 1st, we're gonna just add, schedule a script, which will just toggle, uh, toggle the feature for end users as well. So they will start seeing a new tag. So we already prepared, we did the testing. It's just a matter of flipping the switch and just showing that to the actual users. So the interesting thing about it is that we have an ability to actually roll back these changes because we still have both values in, 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 uh, in the UI. We are calculating both values for each of the items and we store those values, both old and new tags. So at any time, if we screwed up something, we can just flip the switch and let users see the old tax value. So it's easier for rolling back and just it's a safer approach. So by forbidding you to fully finish the feature in one go, you're actually forcing to change your strategy, how you deploy to production and just make it step by step by not affecting users and having a safe way to roll back if something goes wrong. And then the fourth feature is just clean up everything. Like if you're happy with the results, like there's no issues with new tax, we just uh, drop the column, unnecessary database column, uh, clean up the functions, unnecessary one, and just clean up the UI. And it does seem like a safer approach, this uh, CD. And to compare it with the classical one, when we just pile up everything at the end of a sprint with all the features and deploy it to production, it's, let's call it Big Bang. And basically what we're gonna do is just, we need to finish everything in one go. So we will recalculate all tax values if it's required, and we're gonna end up losing the old tax values as well. So then we're gonna change the function so it will calculate new tax from now on, and no UI changes are required because we're just changing the old tax value. So it will just display what's what's newest one. And that's it. It kind of looks like an easy approach, but what happens when we deploy it to production? So first thing is that it will be the first deployment of a feature to production. You made, probably you made a lot of assumptions by deploying it. How you tested that, probably you used uh, expected data, expected load from your users. And it might be that your assumptions are not always correct. So things happen in production, and this is not the safest way to actually test these features. And then uh, other features might also impact you. If you have uh, other features in the, like in the same sprint, you have this, this release candidate, which have lots of features. Well, those features might impact you. You also can impact this, those features with your changes as well. So you can be sure that everything will work as expected. Then, if, other, if, each, if your feature is working as expected and everything is good for that, but other features in that same release can be is causing issues, everything will be rolled back. So your feature as well. And this might create some issues with database. It might even corrupt it. So you won't be able to restore the previous values. And well, if someone needs to stay past midnight on January 1st, then it's like not the best way to, to actually deploy something and then do smoke testing and monitor is it actually working as, as expected not the best way to spend New Year's Eve. So I hope I sold you uh, this concept of continuous deployment, why it's, 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 a, it's a great way to develop software. And the good thing is that if you want to start the journey, it's kind of an easy three-step program. So first step is that identify the constraint, what's holding you up from delivering every, maybe every, every feature, like maybe you have some manual regression, you have to automate that. So remove that constraint. 
and then iterate on another one. Find the next biggest constraint, what's stopping you from being more agile, and then just uh, remove that. And this is basically continuous improvement. And this is a great mode for team to be in. If you're continuously looking at what's not working in your software and then finding that and fixing it, improving, you will always be uh, like uh, finding the best way to for your software to work. You will postpone your software to be legacy. And even now, CD might be the goal. In five years, maybe something else will happen. So if you are continuously improving your system, you will be able to see the trend and then maybe move towards that faster and be more ahead of the curve. So this idea is actually built on a few key pillars. So who are making this change? So first thing is infrastructure. So it's DevOps engineer who are actually making the system work. And your system have to support live deployments. So it doesn't matter when the feature is finished. It might be peak usage time. It should still be able to deploy to production. Then usually what used is the blue green deployments. So it's basically like two version of application is running at the same time, the old one and the new one, and you just flip the switch and it just changes instantly. So it's a, you don't have any loss in performance, changes instant, and your users are not affected by anyhow. You can combine that with canary releases and you can create some kind of interesting approach when you you have these both versions running and you just route just a few percent of your users to that new version. If you see a spike in errors or performance issues, you can just like cancel that deployment, reroute those users back to the old version and like avoid the catastrophe. And this is can be done fully automatically. No human interaction is required. And then if you change so often your application while it's performing, maybe a few two versions of application is working concurrently, your system has to be reliable. It has to be resilient to those changes and perform as expected. One way to monitor that is that uh, have a pulse of like what's happening to the system. Is it behaving? Maybe maybe some errors start to pile up. Maybe there's a spike in some kind of performance, and you have to know that before your end users is able to like inform you about it. So you can be ahead of the curve like to save time and then deploy the fixes faster. So it will just reduce your mean time to recovery. Then we have another pillar, which are based on test engineers. And basically you no longer have the ability to do manual testing for the whole system. What you can do is just, there's a feature, it's developed, then it's tested. So you can test the feature, but after that, there's an automated process to see any regression in the system. So you have to have it so comprehensive and so robust, so you would trust it. If it doesn't find anything, that means there's nothing in the system wrong. And you can just safely deploy it to production. So if you want to be, for it to be successful and stressless, that quality gates should be quite robust. And we're talking about functional testing, we're talking security, performance, accessibility, anything else that you need to comply with, you have to have it fully automated. And then we come to the third pillar, which are developers and architecture for a software have to support like uh, functions like two multiple system, like version of systems running at the same time, no database corruption should be expected then you have to be able to deploy unfinished features to application and it should be able to obstruct it from, from end users. So they won't be noticing anything. So we won't be affected. And we believe that these three pillars are the key ones to actually make this happen. It doesn't mean that the, you come to the DevOps and it makes you this whole thing up but that you can just start doing continuous deployment. It's not only them, it's like developers and test engineers as well. So it's like a whole group. This is why we are doing and uh, moving towards that. We're preparing for it by organizing cross competence trainings. Uh, we have these three groups, uh, these silos breaking each other, like breaking uh, walls between each other and just collectively working together, maybe sharing the knowledge, uh, doing, doing, helping each other out, like uh, sharing the constraints they have and maybe helping fix them or remove them. And then that groups just cooperate together and just that group have to reach that goal. It doesn't mean that one person can actually do that. The whole group, the whole team who are working on the project have to come together and just make it happen. Another thing we have DevOps metrics. So it's like four key metrics uh, from Book Accelerate. So we collecting those. <clears throat> so we have this deployment frequency, how often we deploy. 
uh, deployment duration, lead time, change flow rate, and in some projects we also have mean time to recovery. And we monitor that for all our live like production projects, which we are actually actively working on. And we are saying that the deployment frequency, the higher, the better. And then we have this new metric, deployment duration. This is basically how fast we could move, like do manual regression, then do UAT, then do automated testing, and then deploy to production, how fast it actually can happen, and the lead time, how it usually happens. So the difference between those columns is actually the loss potential for users to be able to using to use those features. And then change color rate is like something to help you guide your journey. Like you can probably do continuous deployment right now. Just enable that every build just go to straight to production, but probably it will cause a lot of issues and a lot of defects in, in the application. So this change color rate just lets you know, are you moving in the right direction or not? And you can see that we already have few projects which are high performance, and they deploying every day or every second day. And those projects have one of the lowest change failure percentage in our company. And well, basically like if you deploying every day, every working day, and you have change failure rate of 2%, that means like you, only one deployment production have escaped defects out of 50. And 49 of them are perfect, like no issues, just new features and users are actually enjoying that. So once per three months that that project have escaped defect and and that's great that, that if you can move so fast and deploy new features every day still keeping that field percentage so low it just uh, it just uh, it just shows you that this is actually possible so those groups are not yet elite or not yet continuous deployment because they still have some downtime but it all comes down to the investment like how much will it cost me to enable this functionality and well we probably we could do some kind of discovery and definition phase and just estimate how much it will gonna cost you but it's very dependent on the project so some of them like waterfall projects probably will require a huge investment to make it to continuous de deployment but maybe if you're so high in continuous delivery and so advanced in that so you can deploy every day Maybe it's not a, such a huge investment to switch to continuous deployment. And that all leads to actually the DevOps. This is this is what it brings all together. Like we have to automate everything, manual deployments and everything manual related to before you to make that deployment is actually contains human error, human errors, might contain them. It's it's a labor cost. We don't usually calculate that, but if we deploy something every two weeks that's 25 deployments per, per year and you have to keep in mind that this might cost like 1000 right now but after a year of building up these features building up the system this will this cost will rise and it's not an investment it's a maintenance cost a tax which you lose after next deployment so if you spend x amount of money to deploy something to production the next time you deploy it after two weeks that investment is zero worth to you doesn't 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 give you any value so it's like a wasted wasted money wasted investment if you're <clears throat> if you're doing uh, automation you actually can save that and your team you can spend more time doing features rather than manually deploying something to production and that's why i love continuous deployment because it's actually have zero tolerance for this manual shenanigans if you're not fully automated, you're not doing it right. You're not yet there. And like, there is no gray area. It's only like, is it fully automated? Yes or no, that's it. So there's no no much of the, like uh, how you can, each of us can interpret that. So it's quite easy to talk about this uh, development of this continuous deployment. So let's quickly summarize what, uh, what we've been through today. So first thing is that CD was first mentioned in 2009 and it's, now starting to pick up and just growing and the more the more teams are actually using that and seeing the benefit of that so it's a proven concept it's no longer an idea it's a proven concept so your users might be spoiled by the other companies who are doing that and they that's might be the new agile standard of what they expect from the companies how fast they can move how fast they can recover from issues and how fast they can react to the feedback from the users and the goal for a continuous deployment is to be able to deploy each completed feature automatically with the change failure rate between zero and 5%. Anything higher than that will probably cause too many issues for the end users if you deploy 
too often. So that's, that could be the target. And then how to get there is to have a continuous improvement uh, for your team as a goal. Like choose the most painful or most gainful constraint and then work towards removing them. Then the transformation has to be driven by the engineering team. Management can enable that. They can set the goal, but they won't be able to actually do the, all the work. So if this is the part for engineering. If you're not capable, if you're not competitive enough, if we don't willing to do that, it ain't going to happen. You will get a lot of excuses why it's not, it's not possible. And if you, if you force them, they will fail and tell you like, well, we told you we we're going to fail. So it's hard to actually force them to do that. If it's not driven by them, it probably will not work. And this is just, you might be already late. You, a lot of companies are actually switching to that. If you have passed this CD as an idea before and said like, this is not something we want to pursue, and when maybe you need to can think about it more like seriously and consider it as an option, which you will enable you to be more competitive. And, but it's never too late as long as you just, uh, as long, the, the sooner you're going to start uh, working towards that, the more catching up you will have to do. So, uh, so yeah, that's it. I have a promotion for the next event before Q&A session. So the next event is going to happen on March 26th, uh, and it will be about managing product debt to maximize business value. And it will be presented by Renata McCurley and Vito Vespolowskis. So if you're interested in maximizing business values, this is something for you. And we come to the end of the slide. So thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. I hope it inspired you to think about continuous de deployment differently, and maybe it will help you move there faster. So maybe you have any questions. Hey, friendly neighborhood moderator. So Nikolaj, great, Nikolai, great job. Uh, we are going to take some questions from the audience now. Um, so speaking of the next Full Stack Friday, uh, our presenter for that, Renata, um, has a question. Um, so we're going to invite her up to stage and uh, get her to ask that. Oh, hang on one moment. All right, she should be coming up in just a moment. Can you hear me now, Nikolai? Yeah, I can hear oh, you now. Great. Yeah, so the, the question I had uh, that we hear a lot from organizations that are very hesitant to uh, start with continuous deployment is how do we convince uh, the, the people who are blockers to this, um, especially when their big concern is around losing customer adoption for features that aren't perfect yet? Great question, by the way. Uh, well, <clears throat> what I believe is that if they're not finished enough, if they're not perfect enough, maybe they shouldn't be exposed to the end users. Like you can do the, all the polishing you need behind the scenes before they actually can use that. You can go with the A-B testing, but if you see the adoption rate is falling, you can just switch back to the original version. So like if you have two versions to, to compare with. So there's multiple ways how you can tackle that. And it's basically, well, it's not finished, don't show it work towards like actually perfecting it and then only then uh, allow everyone to see that or you can do the canary releases and just get the feedback from a few users and then before actually jumping and forcing everyone to use that so i hope it answered your question yeah thanks that's really helpful thank you for your question cool awesome um next up we have Thomas, so let's uh, begin answering his question. Thomas, um, not sure if you would like to join us on stage, but I will give you that option if you would like to. Um, yeah, and um, let's see, one moment. Yep, so Thomas will be joining the stage here. Hi. Hello. So, so sorry, can you hear me? I'm, I'm just trying from phone. So. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so, so yeah. Hi. Good, good session. Thank you very much. And uh, 
just just uh, could you please elaborate uh, a bit how, how do uh, yeah how, how do you break down the features into smaller pieces or or basically almost you know who is involved into that in 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 this process so so it fits for 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 continuous uh, deployment yeah well <clears throat> it very much depends on the features and what projects you're actually working on uh, so Usually teams do short-lived branches or churn-based development and they just uh, try to do the minimal effort they can and usually deploy something, work on something uh, behind the scenes before users can see that. And what's the minimal amount? Is it a function? Is it a, like stub? Or is it like something like that and just deploy partially step by step and then create something, some value afterwards? Even though it's like seems like an like a lot of effort to actually deploy something to production, just like these small pieces. But if it's done automatically, you don't have to care about it. On the benefit side, the code reviews become quite easy. Like there's not like it doesn't end up being like a huge thousand line changes where you, where you have to deploy or like review something. It's small changes we can you actually give the feedback and just see how it's uh, behaving. So you can just you can just uh, load it into your memory, into your RAM, and just uh, actually comprehend what's, what this function does. So basically, it's step by step, the smallest piece you can do, usually like commit by commit, maybe not that often to deploy something to production, but it's just, it's <clears throat> how, you, how you probably deal by like how you just, uh, like convention between your, all the team on, on, on the project, like how small we can get. If you don't think about what I need to do database changes, I need to do backend changes and front end changes in one feature. If you start splitting those, that's already quite a lot of as, as an achievement. And just split them and just deploy them safely without actually ending up affecting users and just learn step by step how to develop features in, in, in production. And then at any point of time, you can check how it's working on real that live data. And then UAT personnel can join at any time and just look at that and then say, okay, enable this for all, the, all our users. And, and from that point, you just enable them without actually separate deployment and then it's available for every user. So, so it's very much depends on the project and yeah. Okay, cool, thank you very much. Thank you for, for the question. To, to add up, probably there are some like industries like uh, like, medical devices which probably will not ever go to continuous deployment if like for example if i'm under anesthesia on that device and it receives the update and something needs to be rolled back probably i wouldn't be trusting that machine that much so those probably will not ever get, get uh, this continuous deployment but there's a lot of areas which can get that and the more experience we have how to split those stories how to we actually can develop software because it's a little bit different Rather than just completing everything as a one package, you can split it up in the smaller ones. So it enables a lot of flexibility. I had never thought in my life about um, continuous deployment on uh, anesthesia, but I will keep that in mind next time I go to the dentist. Yeah, ask if it's uh, if it's hooked to the internet and it's like if it's receiving <laughs> updates often. So yeah, Internet of Things coming to dental drills near you. Cool. Yeah. We have uh, one more question from uh, Mikolaj, uh, who would like to know about the CI CD tools we use in DevBridge. So we will give him the option to come up and join us. So probably I can maybe start answering that. So yeah, go ahead. Because we're working with projects uh, not uh, born like in our own environment, we probably we usually work with clients and with their specific setup. So we usually we use a lot of tools. In <clears throat> in DevRidge, we mostly using Jenkins for our like internal products, but we also use uh, ThemeCity or at least was using it before. And in, on client infrastructure, we have lots of things starting from Azure DevOps uh, to I think. Well, uh, boom, something with Bamboo, CI or whatever. There's a, there's a lot of things, a lot of tools which are 
uh, which is used. Not everyone is doing CD like continuous deployment, but with continuous delivery, there's a lot of tools to support that. So it's a variety of things. And sometimes it depends on the client. Sometimes we take something fresh from the market, which would, which would fit the best, the situation, the project, the stack we're actually working on. And yeah, it's, it's a various tools. There's no like template one, like for everyone. So yeah, great question. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Um, so it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, actually, I'm about to send out uh, the white paper that you had wrote and written about uh, CICD. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and what's what's covered in, in that white paper? Yeah. Thanks for reminding me that. Uh, I totally forgot to, to mention that one. So basically, this presentation was born from the white paper we just published, advancing from continuous delivery to continuous deployment. There's more in depth on each of these uh, pillars, how to advance that, how we actually doing that, how we are introducing that to our like clients and our like teams. And just uh, there's more things. If, if you're interested in continuous deployment, it might be a good start there. Uh, so yeah, you can just um, read through it and give, give us the feedback. Uh, we'll be really interested to hearing from you. Cool. Awesome. Um, and let's see, we have one more question coming in um, from Maris asking if there is any specific tool you would recommend for small teams. Uh, that's, that's a good one. Um, somehow I see that people are preferring uh, Jenkins. I'm not sure if it's like uh, the best tool for CD. Yeah, I believe it could be used in that manner, uh, but this is one of the often ones, like it's an old school, there's open source, there's a lot of plugins already written for that one. And there's a lot of like flexibility, how you can set it up and what it can give you and how what results you can achieve with that. So probably this one, one of the best ones, like at least if you consider something, uh, look at its like not specification, but limitations more of it sort and then compare it with your like what you require from ci cd tool so it might fit your bill it might not it just it's more of like preference and what you need what's your stack is like if you're doing <clears throat> maybe building some kind of like applications for mobile phones and the native ones maybe something else might be a better choice but i know that we are actually did that with uh, jenkins as well so it's like it's a, it's, it's doable you just need specific agents to set it up then it, it, it's good to go so. So th thank you for the question. Yes, um, thank you, Nikolai. Um, it does not look like we have any more uh, questions. Um, and we were able to, I mean, if they do have questions, they can read your white paper, right? Because that has every question you would ever want to know about continuous delivery and deployment. It's the Bible to it. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope you, you're right. I believe it as well, so <laughs> so it's make both of us, at least two of us. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, uh, we're all done here. Thank you, Nikolai, for a great presentation. Thank you, everyone who joined us today. Please be sure to sign up for the next one. Um, we will be sending out an email, uh, likely Monday or Tuesday, with the full recording to this, so you can watch it at home. You know, some of you might be running out of things to watch on Netflix, and you need to mix it up. So. You'll be able to watch this Full Stack Friday presentation whenever you would like. Um, but thank you again for joining us, and we will see you at the next event. Thank you. Have a great uh, rest of the day and, and nice Friday. Bye.